gentlemen, welcome back from uh, lunch. Uh, we're now running three and a half minutes behind schedule, um, but we'll catch that up uh, so that you're not late to break. Um, on your tables, you'll see some marketing material from one of our sponsors, Mosaic Search and Selection. That's actually my day job. I only actually run this conference evenings and weekends. Uh, my proper job is uh, recruitment in the academic publishing, scholarly communications, library kind of space. This is the most interesting piece of marketing material you've received so far. I don't say that just because I'm biased, but it's got um, little life histories of some people that we did searches for and appointed. So part of the fun of that is you can try and read these, uh, these little stories and see if you can identify the people in the room uh, who are actually covertly described in there. So that should be a fun thing to do, uh, not during these presentations, but in the break. Um, right, so we now have a session on artificial intelligence, and we have two excellent speakers for that. Um, in your program, you'll see Jim Longo. Um, Jim, unfortunately, is unable to be with us, uh, but um, Ollie Rickard has taken his place and is an excellent substitute because uh, he actually worked with Jim on a lot of the stuff that Jim's going to be talking about. So um, we're not having somebody presenting somebody else's present presentation so much as a sort of co-presenter presenting the material that, um, that Jim would have presented if he'd been here. Um, also, uh, Ollie speaks proper English, not American English, which is nice. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, and then followed by uh, Mike Upshaw from Unsilo, uh, who will be also talking about uh, artificial intelligence. So um, could you just uh, welcome the first speaker, please? Hi, everyone. So it's uh, day two, you've just had lunch, and I feel a little bit like one of the parasites from the, the keynote speech yesterday, because I am from the gold sponsor, I am corporate me, but I promise you I'm not a parasite, it's fine. Um, I'm gonna tell you, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a survey of lots of the partners that Highwire have been working with, and it's actually the partners that we work with that do all the clever stuff. One of those is Michael here at Unsilo, so he's going to be going in depth into what he does, and I'll give you more of a horizontal scan, a, a kind of low level uh, idea of lots of different people and how they're using AI for specifically for publishing. First question here is Is it just a whole load of hype? I don't think so, specifically because the uh, publishing industry happens to be suffering from certain challenges which happen to be the things that AI is good at. So, not all industries need this stuff, and you guys. Uh, happen to be one of the ones that I think could really benefit from it. Have you, have you guys seen this kind of graph before? The Gartner hype cycle? Nobody. Somebody. <laughs> A few. Okay, so the idea of this is something new happens and we all get really, really excited. There's this innovation trigger on the left-hand side. We're like, yay, this is a really cool thing. We get really excited. We think this is going to change the world. We have this peak of inflated expectation. And I think that's been going on in AI for about 20 years. And we're like, this is going to be amazing. And then you suffer the trough of disillusionment and you think, actually, no, this is just loads of hard work and is it any different to just normal computer stuff and what's the point? But then slowly, gradually, you climb the slope of enlightenment and you reach the plateau of productivity. And I think that's where we're getting to with, with AI. But that's not what they say themselves. So an interesting thing about this, this graph here is AI isn't one thing. It's a ton of different things. It's like a syndrome. It's lots of different techniques. And they share some common features. And I appreciate you can't read any of those at all on that screen. So if we zoom in a little bit and pick a few. <clears throat> so on the right-hand side there, we've got speech recognition. That's something that's actually now happening. You've, lots of you will have Alexa in your home, and that's something that's actually working. We can use it, and it's not weird, and, and you can talk to it and stuff, and that's, that's actually going really well. On the left-hand side here, we've also got machine learning and natural language processing, which are two other AI techniques. Now, on this graph, which is from last year, they are plunging down into the, the trough. Um, I would argue that actually, for publishing anyway, there are lots of products which have got along further than, uh, along than that, and they're, they're way up on, on the, uh, rising up to that plateau on the, on the other side. So, that's where we're at. What does that mean for you guys? Do you have to worry about this? How are you gonna make it work? That sounds quite scary. There's like a million different techniques. How are you as publishers, and why should you care? The idea is, you don't care, you can use people like us to help you get there. So this is another thing, I don't know if you, have you, any of you seen this before, Wardley Maps? Less, one, two, Tasha's seen everything. 
<laughs> um, so this, that's a really, I'm almost putting this in here because it's a very interesting thing in its own right. If you're interested in, the, in this, just look up Wardy Maps and see what they do. It's about how business processes develop over time. And, and people have used this to work out how they should manage their business and do stuff. So actually, or lots of you are in business, of course. That might be quite interesting for you in a completely uh, tangent way. But for us today, the thing that's interesting is that axis at the bottom. So along there, it's a very, quite a similar thing to the hype cycle. We've got these different stages of, of how a process might develop. We start with the genesis. We have an idea. We have things that's going to work. Then we have to custom build things. We have to make them from scratch every single time. Then people develop products. And you go, OK, I can just buy this product. I can use it. And eventually, you have something which is a commodity or a utility. So an example of something that's now a utility is broadband. You don't have to do anything. You just turn it on. It's there. You have to do a little bit, but not much. Um, and in, the, in this example up here, this is, this is a website. Uh, it's actually from a few years ago. So in a, this website on the right-hand side, power is the commodity. But at this stage, you had to build each website. But now things are changing. And certainly lots of things like software as a service, uh, things are being pushed to that right-hand side. Anyway, back to the main thing. Product is the thing that matters here. So there are lots of aspects of AI which are now available to us as products. So you can go in, you can choose them, you can say, I want to use that product and get it to do something for me. The key thing here is, you, you, again, you don't have to do that yourselves. You don't have to go and start looking into all the AI products and wonder what there are. Um, there are lots of people like us, and apparently these other guys here, don't look at them, um, who know about all the products. So, so we, uh, one thing that we can do for you is assess this, the, the, all, the, all this work and bring it to you and, and engage with you with that. So products and partnerships together, I think, is what, what will help you. Wait a minute, wait, why, 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 why do you care? The reason you care is, to go back to what we were saying earlier, is the specific challenges you have, and they kept coming up again and again over the last uh, couple of days, are things that AI can help you with. So we have a few of these. We're getting from researcher to reader. One of the biggest challenges people keep talking about over the last couple of days was volume. There's always like, there's tons of articles. People keep writing stuff. There's loads more researchers doing stuff. The whole world is, is becoming involved in this, not just you know, particular countries. It's everyone. They're all piling all this stuff in. It feels quite scary. How on earth are we going to kind of deal with this volume? It seems to be a, a big issue. Another thing is speed. So uh, there were some talks yesterday that were talking about how innovation and collaboration meant that research could happen more quickly, which is great, but again, that's pouring more into the volume. But on the other hand, we, we're trying to get the research out quickly as well. We want to get it into the real world. When something happens, we want to be able to have that research distributed as quickly as possible. So speed matters as well. And of course, with all that volume, speed is more difficult. And the other thing, again, with the talk last night, we had that really interesting uh, discussion about gender bias in publishing. There's a lot of bias going on, not just gender bias, there are other biases uh, all over the place. And of course, what we'd really like in scientific publishing is no bias. That would be great. And again, I think that's something that AI could possibly help with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go, I think it's six different AI products that, that, that we've been um, looking at and interested in. Uh, they cover various different uh, stages in, in the publication uh, workflow. So here we've got submission, peer review, editorial, and discovery. And the first one of those is on the silo. So I'm not going to talk about this much because that's Michael's entire talk. So I'm, that would be bad of me. Um, but one of the things I want to bring out uh, just for context here is and silo have a product called Evaluate. And that has, does a couple of things. One is it's used for screening submissions. So um, when a manuscript is submitted, you, you can run it through Evaluate, and it will give you an idea of, of how good that, that manuscript is before you have to do anything uh, with a human. Um, the other thing that, that Unsilo has is a process for finding peer reviewers. So we was, there was a talk again about bias essay and the fact that, that when you look for peer review, there are certain connections that you have and certain people that you know and so on, and, and so you, you, you have certain ways that you find peer reviewers. The idea of, of this Unsilo product is that you take that away from humans and what it does is it looks at the article, it, it creates a semantic fingerprint of that article, and then matches that against lots of other articles, looks at those authors and says, okay, well, these people are clearly working in a similar area, why don't you go and talk to them and, and, and gives you a list of potential peer reviewers. So again, what we're trying to do there is that this particular AI thing is hitting all three of those things, volume, speed, and bias in one go. Well done. 
Uh, next thing here is uh, Simveo. So they're operating at the editorial phase of, of the publication workflow. And what they're doing is they're using natural language processing for um, analyzing manuscripts as well. And this is uh, something they've been doing in conjunction with Taylor and Francis. I think someone was talking about this yesterday. Are they still here? Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is the thing that was in conjunction with Taylor and Francis, and, and what they're doing is they're, they're using uh, natural, language, natural, natural language processing to analyze their, their manuscripts, and then according to the score that the AI gives the manuscript, it gets put into different workflows. And so something that that's the AI thinks is great can step forward a few steps and can go further forward in the workflow and hopefully be dealt with much more quickly. So a high quality manuscript can be dealt with really quickly whereas something which gets a very low score gets put back. Um, and, and what the AI also does is, is it can do very simple changes. I, I know we'd probably be worried about any changes at all, but anyway, it does grammatical fixes and so on. Um, so again, with Simveo, what they're looking up is volume and speed. They're trying to get things through the system, and they're trying to deal with, a, with this larger volume of material. Uh, the next one is Meta. Has anyone heard of Meta? Lots of people, brilliant. So I won't, go, I won't spend too long on that one. So that's, uh, this is Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and what they're doing is they are analyzing uh, biomedical preprints. They are using a knowledge graph to um, do that analysis, and then they are uh, using it for, for us, for horizon scanning, that's what they call it. The idea is that they want people to be trying to look to the future to see what are the trends that are gonna be happening that they should be thinking about that they don't even know about yet. That's the idea, is to try and get people to think about things. They don't have to search for it, because they don't know what it is. It's a new thing. But they think that, that by, by doing this kind of analysis of, of these preprints, and then giving that out to you, you, you can have a think about what's coming next. Um, they do have a, uh, a way you can set up alerts. This is kind of not quite the same thing, but in this here, I've, I've, I've got a feed here that I've set up, so this will then email me when preprints are, uh, go on um, that they analyze. Um, the clever thing here isn't so much in this alert system, which we've all seen lots of alert system, it's the fact that this is based on this knowledge graph underneath, which is making lots of connections which wouldn't otherwise be made. So again here, volume is the deal. We've got a massive, massive pile of stuff. How on earth can we all think about it and, and understand it and, and go through it? Uh, next one, in fact the next three are all operating in a very similar area, so this is all about trying to improve discovery. So once everything's gone through the process and, and it's all sitting there, how do we get it out to the researchers? So the first one of these is Access Innovations, um, and what they do is they take an existing taxonomy, so MESH for example, we've done some work with the, with the MESH taxonomy with them, and they use AI to classify content against that taxonomy. And they do that not just by uh, assigning terms automatically, but they also give those terms weightings. So you might have a particular article which is about blood, but it's about blood with a weighting of 500, whereas some other article is about blood with a weighting of 20. Um, and the interesting thing with their approach is the taxonomy itself is created manually, it's not created by the AI. So the taxonomy is out there, it's either one of our standards like MeSH, or it's something that, that you know, you've created yourself as, as a publisher. So again, trying to deal with that problem of volume. You know take that a step further. So they have a pro project, uh, product called Unearth, and what you know Unearth does is it starts from scratch. So it doesn't have a taxonomy to begin with, it looks at your corpus of content and says, okay, I'm gonna start analyzing this stuff and it generates the taxonomy as well. So if you're thinking about bias, that seems to me pretty interesting that, that you're, again, you're trying to remove bias from the system. I don't know what biases are in mesh, but you know, it has been created by people and people think about the world in certain ways and maybe that's not quite how the world is. So it's an interesting idea, this, that they're actually generating the, the taxonomy as well and then they do a similar thing of, of applying the, the uh, of, of classifying all the content against that taxonomy. Um, you know are slightly different than the others in that they use neural networks to do that. If, if any of you want any more information about the technical side of this, just come and ask me afterwards, I can give you some stuff. So again, yeah, volume and bias are, are a couple of things here that are, that are hit by the you know product. So then the last one here is Semantic Scholar, 
And they do something slightly different to those others. So again, what they're trying to do is they're trying to analyze a big corpus of content. They're trying to get metadata out of there. They're trying to uh, disambiguate terms. They disambiguate authors, make it clear which, what, what a concept is and, and which one it isn't. So you might have something that's got, say, Java the coffee or Java the island or Java the programming language, and it will work out which that those are all things that are different. Um, but what, what, it, what it does differently is rather than applying it to your content, it takes your content from you. So, so we at Highwire, actually, what we do is we deliver our content to Semantic Scholar. They put it into their big pot with lots of other content. So they have a massive, massive pile of content. This is run by the Allen Institute. Um, and then they do two things. One is they have a web interface that everyone can use. So they have a, a public Google-style search box. And you can go in there and you can search across all this content that's been delivered by lots of publishers. How, are any of you using Semantic Scholar already, in fact? There's a few. Um, so, so, so again, in terms of discovery, that's great because there's another portal in which your content is available. Of course, when it gets down to actual full text content, all access um, controls still apply. Um, but then the other thing that they do is they give you APIs. So you've given them your content. They're using that to, and for them it's great because they want content because that helps them to understand how to do their job, how to analyze all the stuff. Um, and what they give you in return is uh, APIs where you can pull back all the metadata that they've extracted. So they extract things like the list of authors or, or the taxonomy terms or whatever it is that they pull out of the content. So they've got a representation of your content that is much more rich than what you already have. But they give that back to you in APIs. So you can then call those APIs, get back all that data that they've extracted, and then store that in your own systems to engage you to uh, improve your own discovery as well. So it just works in a slightly different way to the others. So that's that, indeed, that is the, that's the, the interface that they have. Um, uh, if you just go to Spanish Scholar on the internet, that's what you'll see. Again, volume, there's a whole pile of stuff. How are we going to get through it all? And this, is, this is a way of helping with that. So I'm just going to end with a few thoughts uh, rather than summaries. Some of these are kind of future things. Uh, I think it is a great time to be leveraging these products. It's kind of we're at a bit of a sweet spot now where um, they have turned into products rather than being kind of custom little things or things you have to build to do specific tasks. They are products. Um, I think an interesting question is how do we now, you know, as, 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 as you might have gathered from that thing there, there was a few that do quite similar things in quite sometimes different ways and sometimes similar ways. But how do we evaluate those? I don't know yet. How, how that's the thing I'm interested in is which method is best for you as a publisher when you've got a certain type of, type of, uh, type of content. Um, I know that the work we did recently with Access Innovations and McGraw-Hill took a long time to evaluate, a long, long time. And that was part of our key learnings in that was how, how do we evaluate that stuff? How do we see if it's, if it's, if it's um, making a difference? In fact, one thing that you know did with Unearth is they, they took a subset of their books and, and run, ran the AI on it to, to generate these, these extra metadata and then put that out into the wild and then compared that subset against another subset which didn't have this extra metadata added to see whether the improved discovery, if there was any, would actually make a difference in terms of money. Are they going to get any more money from doing this? And they found out that they did. They, I think it was they had a whole set of books. They added 75 keywords, which are generated automatically by the AI, onto that set of books. And they got a 30% increase in the money that they earned from those books. So that was a way of them going, OK, this actually makes a difference. Not that money is the end of everything, but you know. Um, and then, you know, we've, we, impact factor, we're not happy with it. It doesn't mean quality, et cetera, et cetera. That amazing talk yesterday about the customizational metrics, and that was so, so fascinating that you had all these different ways that, that you could uh, possibly measure things. I'm intrigued by AI in that area as well, because what AI is good at is uh, patterns and analysis and, and plowing through a whole ton of stuff. And is there a way that we could use it to kind of get some kind of quality score on an article? I don't know. Um, and then remember, algorithms have bias too. They are written by people. Well, at least sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're written by the AI itself. But you know, the, the AI is created by a person. And just because it's in a computer doesn't mean it's not biased. Of course, we need to be really, really careful that when we are using AI in these sort of ways that, that we are happy with, with what is actually going on underneath. Um, crap references here that some one person might get. Um, we we're really worried about uh, gatekeepers. We don't want to have machines being the gatekeepers to content. We want them to 
flow the content to us in a nice open way. So I think a key thing here is to remember that, that we're not talking about AI being a gatekeeper or being something even worse. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're getting AI to do the grunt work to deal with this massive scale that we've got, and then we can leave it to us to do the clever stuff afterwards. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, for the, um, for, for the invitation. And, and um, I'm very pleased that um, uh, there's going to be not one but two talks about AI in the, in, in, in the conference. So we're taking this um, very seriously. Um, I'm going to talk about um, why the take-up of AI has been so limited. Um, and um, in contrast to Ollie's talk, which is a more sort of general survey, I'm going to look at one, um, um, one area in more detail, not so much for the product as the methodology, and to, um, to, uh, to, to, to the, the goal is to give you an idea of um, uh, some aspects of how this works, uh, what works, and what uh, humans and machines can and can't do together. So as Mark says, I work with Ansilo, um, uh, founded about two th founded 2012. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, it was acquired by Cactus Communications, um, but we'll continue to, to run with the Ansilo brand. Um, we, uh, we specialize in text analytics and uh, we've been involved in AI ever since uh, we were founded, um, working with uh, academic publishers. My background, I, years ago I was a publisher and, um, and uh, so, so I've, I've got some experience of, um, of how this sort of stuff is, is, uh, is applied. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some common complaints about AI, um, uh, give a little introduction to um, this particular technology. As Ollie says, there are, there are several different uh, flavors of AI. Um, see how it applies to the academic publishing workflow. Just mention briefly taxonomies and classification systems, and then I'll give you a couple of examples of how the AI can be used uh, in practice with, um, with, with publishers. So, uh, we all complain about AI, um, uh, it's a black box. It's biased, it's not accurate. Um, we don't have any control. Um, it'll put me out of work. Um, and many of those, um, many of those comments are, are, are undoubtedly have some, uh, some justification. But one of the challenges is that um, AI is a vast subject. AI refers to, um, to many, many disparate types of, um, types of technology, many, um, many different tools. And um, uh, AI has become ubiquitous enough today so that, so that, so that it can be blamed for, for, um, for, for most things that are happening. Um, so, uh, the first thing uh, I think we should concentrate on is a particular form of AI that, um, uh, that Ansilo uses is um, uh, really a quite a narrow area uh, working on text. So, um, uh, Ansilo is, um, is, a, is a corpus based technology using, um, um, uh, using the, the statistical and, um, and, and, and AI tools to, um, to analyze um, a text. So, this is a, um, an academic abstract. Um, and Traditionally, what would um, uh, the way that um, the, the way that a publisher would um, would um, uh, get some idea about what this text is about is by looking for individual entities. So you'd look for um, uh, chemicals or um, or diseases or species, uh, sort of nouns in the in in the text, and um, and then put those into some kind of classification system. What Ansilo does is fundamentally different. It um, uh, it starts with a corpus. And um, most of the examples I give you today will be based on the um, on, on uh, PubMed and Medline, the sort of medical corpus, corp, corpora. So, so the the, um, the examples will all be will be medical, and um, and analyzes this text in context um, against this corpus, and finds phrases, words and phrases which are statistically significant, uh, a kind of genetic fingerprint for the um, for the for the uh, for this article so instead of searching for individual terms which it does it um, typically finds um, phrases and those phrases are shown in yellow on the um, uh, on the abstract and it's picking up terms like um, sodium concentration or serum sample or uh, margins of error and you'll see it uh, immediately that these are not the sort of terms that a taxonomist would pick up 
um, they may be significant for the, uh, for, the, for the text because the text might talk about um, the, uh, direct reading or, or, or high temperature or low temperature, um, but um, these are not necessarily the sort of things that you pick up in a, in a taxonomy. When the system has found all these phrases and it finds thousands and thousands, uh, several hundred phrases for one academic article, it then, uh, it then compares that, um, uh, those phrases and uh, we have a set of tools, um, uh, syntactic and semantic tools, to, uh, to pull all those, um, uh, all those phrases together. So you all appreciate that um, um, sodium concentration, concentration of sodium is the same thing in a syntactically different way. Um, so, uh, and then we pull together these, uh, these, these, these phrases and come up with, um, with, with, uh, with terms which are significant for this, uh, for this document. And in that way, create a kind of fingerprint which enables us to, um, to do things with, um, with, uh, with, with the text. What's remarkable is the fundamental um, algorithm is not itself language-based. We have language tools to, to, uh, to, to find syntactic variations, but the, um, um, the, 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 the tool requires simply a large enough corpus. It's not um, exclusive to science. It works in any area where you've got a big enough, um, a big enough set of documents. To give you some idea, some of you might be familiar with something called the permuted index, which is, uh, which is uh, well known uh, 20 years ago when, um, um, uh, as a quick, and, uh, a quick way of producing an index for a large, um, a large text. And I've taken that phrase, indirect potentiometry, and um, imagine if you've got a million words, you can uh, find uh, a million words of scientific text, you can find all examples of this phrase, and you can look at the words before it and after it, and you start to get a feel for, even if you didn't know what indirect potentiometry was, you could start to get a feel for what kind of context this, this phrase exists in. You can see it's, uh, there are references to amino acids, to gases, to, um, to, to concentration. Um, and um, uh, by, looking at the, by, by looking at the phrase in context, you can start to build a picture, and you'll appreciate that if, uh, if you extended this system, um, you can find um, semantically related uh, phrases, uh, near or uh, synonyms, um, appear in the same kind of place, in the same kind of sentences. So if you imagine um, heart attack and myocardial infarction tend to appear in, the same, uh, in similar sentences with similar words around them. And by using this similarity, you start to identify uh, correspondences between terms um, and, um, uh, and thereby to, to, to understand where, where different ways of saying similar things. So another way of, of saying it is keyword in context, which is a, um, uh, was uh, formerly used as an indexing method. Just to emphasize the, um, the, the, the kind of AI I'm talking about, uh, there was a, an interesting book um, by Pedro Domingos, uh, published in 2015, which, um, which identified five major s schools of AI. And we're just talking about one small uh, um, area of this. Um, um, in in, in Domingos' terms, uh, this is a connectionist uh, tool. Um, um, but uh, you can see it's, it's one of many, and, um, and I think one of the, the things to remember that um, uh, the different, tool, different flavors of AI have different criteria, work in different ways, and, um, and have to be evaluated in different, um, uh, along different lines. Another, another technique that, um, uh, that we, we do use, and uh, it is widespread, is, um, is uh, using a training set. And you're all familiar with uh, AI identifying differences between cats and dogs. You, um, you show the machine 100 pictures of a cat, and you show the machine 100 pictures of a dog. And, um, and uh, when you show it the next picture, it says it's a cat or it's a dog. What could be simpler? Till you get to that, um, uh, OK, that, that should be. Uh, that. That's a, uh, that's a picture of a, uh, that, that's a casualty of transferring to PowerPoint. <laughs> but that's a, um, uh, when you have a, when you, when you have a, a, a cat with, a, a dog with lots of, lots of cat-like hair, it's, um, uh, the machine falls over because the machine doesn't have, the machine hasn't seen, you haven't identified in your training set a, um, uh, an example which the machine can recognize. The principle of, uh, that we have here is that, that um, a training system is only as good as the humans who have provided the training data to train that system. That if you don't provide, um, uh, if you don't provide en enough examples, then, um, then uh, the system will fall over. Um, so training sets um, inherently have a limitation in that they're based around the humans who have put, those, um, put those, uh, those, uh, that data together. Um, 
Of course, you could say if the system could, um, could, if you could feed back to the system, then you could improve the system. But that requires a human, a human input, which can be done, but, but the system needs it. Let's move on to the academic publishing workflow. I'm sure you'll all be familiar with um, Kramer and Bozeman in 2015 did a famous diagram which summarized um, um, many of the innovations in, uh, in publishing technology all around six major stages in the academic life cycle, discovery, assessment, outreach, and so on and so forth. I'm just going to look at um, uh, one small area, which is the, um, um, which is the submission area of, uh, uh, in, from, this, um, from, this, from this diagram. But the technology can apply right across the right across the board, and as Ollie said, and as ever, has been a repeated theme throughout this um, throughout this conference, um, the problem we have is one of scale. Um, if we could do, if we could assess scientific articles by hand, it wouldn't be a problem. But with 3,000 new science articles published every day, it's too big for any uh, for any human to, um, uh, to to manage. It's too big for any editor to, to handle. It's too big for any author in the space to be able to keep up with what the papers that are being being published. The statistic I like on that one is the. Um, uh, the, the, the ASCO conference, ASCO is the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, 5,000 papers presented in one week. How on earth do you as a scientist sort of work out which of the papers relevant to what you're going you're, you're to be doing? And they're all about cancer. Um, so classifications. Classifications could be, um, should be a solution to, to, to this. If you, um, if you simply classify your content, then, uh, then uh, everything should be straightforward. So kind of classifications, I think Ollie already mentioned uh, MESH, which is the medical subject headings, um, uh, and there are more formal uh, taxonomies and, uh, and, and, and ontologies. Um, these are all created um, um, largely by humans um, uh, with a view to, to trying to give some sort of an indication of what, an, what content is about. So what you have here is um, one of the, uh, just one example of the MESH subject headings. There are, there are some uh, 30 or 40,000 of these, and this is, um, this is one about heart attacks. And you can see down at the bottom, it's difficult to see on this screen, down at the bottom some of the, um, some of the synonymous terms that have been dis um, tagged by human information specialists related to heart attack. So you've got myocardial infarction, heart attack, um, um, cardiovascular stroke, and so on. Um, there's an army of librarians who are sort of um, looking at medical content on a continuing basis and picking out these phrases and, uh, and updating the, 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 the MESH headings um, on an ongoing basis. But you'll appreciate that this kind of, um, this kind of task is, um, is limited and slow, and uh, it will always be imperfect. It requires expert curators. Um, humans, by their very nature, don't always agree. Um, it can never be granular enough in that um, uh, the, number of, um, the, the, the number of phrases in, uh, in medical texts is, is uh, infinite, and, and uh, there won't be enough, uh, you haven't got enough human resources to cover all those, um, all those terms, and it requires constant maintenance. So in contrast, this technology, and Ansalo isn't the only company that, uh, that, that uses this technology, um, using the concept extraction method that I, did, I, I uh, described earlier, automatically identifies. So what you've got on the left-hand side is heart disease. On the right-hand side is all of the synonymous and uh, related terms identified from the Medline corpus, 28 million um, abstracts, um, that, um, uh, that uh, have a similar or, or identical meaning to, the, uh, to, the, to, to heart disease. It's a mixture of synonyms and related, related terms. The great advantage of a system like this is that um, it finds um, um, it's limited only to the size of the corpus that you're indexing. So if with a bigger corpus, it'll find more terms. And if a new article is added to the corpus, it will find related terms from that as well. So it's an ongoing, real-time, continuing updated resource without the humans in the middle. One of the benefits of it is that um, uh, it, 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 it just, it's scalable. It handles uh, way, way more terms than, uh, than, than uh, on the left-hand side of this, this rather simplistic graph is, is, um, is uh, typical human classification, so corporate taxonomies or BSAC has, uh, is the, the book industry classification system for, uh, used by, by, by uh, major uh, trade publishers. InSpec is a few thousand terms. Mesh is um, uh, uh, maybe a couple of hundred thousand terms. But um, this kind 
of machine learning a, a, a technique uh, is in the millions and can therefore be far more granular, can find far more um, precise distinctions between meaning than, uh, than any human system could ever achieve. So there's a summary, I won't go through this, of, um, of, of some of the differences. Uh, the, 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 I, I won't talk about rule-based systems, but um, um, the, the unsupervised machine learning uh, that I've described is immediately updated, uh, eliminates the cataloging, um, and adds things in, uh, in real time. So which approach to use? There's a, um, the, the, the STM did a, does a, 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 a regular report into, um, into scholarly publishing, and um, uh, very appropriately, and I think one of the authors of the report is in the room, um, uh, made the following recommendation in their last, uh, last report, that saying, if you, um, if you want to do an al analytics on content, um, it's no longer the case that you should immediately start with a taxonomy. It, it makes sense to look at um, uh, other technologies um, that can give you um, uh, uh, the results that you want. So that's, I think, one of the things to take away is um, I'm not saying that uh, this technology is better than taxonomies. I'm not saying it's, um, uh, but, but it's fundamentally different. And there are, uh, there are opportunities, there are occasions when it can be and should be, um, should be considered. So here's an example, finding peer reviewers. This has been mentioned several times in, the, um, uh, in, in, in at this conference. Um, so um, problems with current peer review is that um, uh, 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 papers are often still tagged by uh, keywords, and, um, and those keywords may be generated by authors or by editors, and uh, either way they're done by hand, and they're going to be small scale and not very precise. Um, um, frequently they're based around an in-house reviewer database, and we've been talking about bias, but um, uh, it's the case that, that um, in-house um, publisher uh, reviewer collections tend to be biased towards people who've reviewed things uh, in the past, and those people in the past tend to be white males, whereas the people writing papers are often coming from China. <laughs> And um, so you can see there's a mismatch in the, um, in the, in the, the, the corpus where you're finding the reviewers and, uh, and the papers coming in. Much of the workflow is manual, and uh, you'll all, anyone who's familiar with, uh, with the peer review process knows that many, many reviewers have to be contacted uh, to get one acceptance. So there is a better way, and uh, uh, um, uh, yes, another, another stat, 20, 26% of, this is a Wiley stat, 26% uh, um, of US academics contacted with peer review declined because the paper was outside their subject area. Not for, not for any other reason. So, so n being able to find a peer reviewer with subjects, uh, with the relevant subject knowledge is clearly a challenge and, uh, and is not being managed very successfully. So what you see on the screen here is um, an example of, um, of, of uh, the, the, the Unsilo peer review system. On the right-hand side, you've got an article. Um, you paste the article onto the, into the site, and uh, it, the system automatically identifies concepts from it. It then matches those concepts with all the articles in, um, in, 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 in Medline and finds um, authors, and the first one is shown here with, um, uh, with overlapping concepts. Uh, and then it indicates those reviewers in order of in order of relevance. The first thing to remember is that, um, uh, and the, one of the fundamental um, recommendations for your use of AI is um, the system doesn't choose for you. The system gives you recommendations. You choose. Um, you look at these and you decide. Uh, and at that point, you can then decide if the um, uh, if you want to contact the reviewer. And various tools are provided. Uh, we do include um, a, a kind of H index, and there's a list of the um, each for each reviewer. It's listed um, how many years they've been active in the subject, how many papers they've are, they've authored. It gives links to the papers, and you could look at and you could find all these papers by hand but not as quickly as this. Um, and uh, you can see the bar, we've grouped together some of the concepts. So this is an article about um, uh, fitness after, uh, after um, for, for adults with Alzheimer's. So um, on the left-hand side is a group of concepts which are clustering the, the, the concepts that have been found in the article. And you can choose which of those uh, five or six concepts you want to, uh, you want to uh, focus on in order to find the reviewers. So it's a mixture of AI and human tools. You can choose your preference for, for where you want the, um, the, the reviewers to be found. Here's another case study, um, collect, uh, creating subject collections. Um, uh, a lovely example, you're all familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
um, created in, I think, 2015, 2017. Um, and uh, the United Nations sort of came up with, um, with, these, with these, uh, these wonderful uh, goals for the planet. Um, which, um, uh, unfortunately, are a taxonomist nightmare because um, they, uh, there are things like life on land or life below water, which doesn't sort of um, uh, fit with a taxonomy particularly well. Uh, the challenge, um, uh, this is a, 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 um, a project we, we did with OECD to tag all of their 250,000 documents to um, one or more of the sustainable development goals. They could have put an army of people onto indexing it by hand, but instead, in this case, we used a training set um, you can see the documents in the middle are examples of the training set and then from that training set we extracted, those are documents which, which um, uh, uh, United Nations had uh, created and, and referred to, these, to, to, the, to these, um, these, these concepts. We used that as a starting point, we then extracted the concepts which are, you can see around the edges of those um, um, uh, of those documents. So this is gender equality and it comprises concepts like sexual harassment, physical violence, uh, uh, child marriage, reproductive health. And those concepts were then used to match the, uh, um, the other articles in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the system. OECD, to their credit, built a lovely graphic um, which enables you to see how all this, uh, all this fits together. And you can see the individual concepts at the same time on the left-hand side. Um, uh, so mental health, infant mortality, this is good health and well-being, another one of the, um, the, 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 the concepts. So the whole thing could be, uh, so it was possible to, to, to tag a corpus to the, um, to, uh, if you like, a new taxonomy in a, in a matter of days rather than, um, rather than months. Uh, one last example, this is um, uh, um, uh, very appropriately the British Medical Journal. <laughs> Um, uh, based, based here where um, they have, as you can imagine, many, um, uh, um, uh, they have around 50 journals. Um, many of those journals include um, articles about, um, about cardiology um, and, um, and the, the task here was to create a, a single collection that was regularly updated of recent articles on cardiology from all their journals. Um, the, the motivation for this became because um, uh, it was originally done by hand, it was easy to build it, but it was impossible to maintain it. Um, so um, they gave up when they got to about 20 subject collections. So we've now up to, we're, we're, we're planning this year to, to build around 200 um, and to go from cardiology down to much more granular levels. And this is all done using that concept matching system we showed earlier. Uh, just another example of bias. So I think you've seen plenty, plenty of examples, but um, uh, I just want to, I'm showing you this slide simply because uh, I want to emphasize that um, I'm, not, um, uh, I'm not claiming that any of the algorithms that we, we create are free of bias, but, um, but um, one of the challenges uh, that we work with as a, with a corpus-based um, uh, tool is that um, uh, the, 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 the corpus itself um, will, be, uh, will be subject to bias in that, um, in, uh, and, and here's an example. I, I, uh, in Google, it may have changed since then, but last May I keyed in most Grand Slam wins tennis. And the answer was Roger Federer. Um, when I keyed in most Grand Slam wins woman tennis, I got Serena Williams. And you'll see that Serena Williams has more, won more major singles titles than Roger Federer. The problem is not with the algorithm in this case. The problem is with the, um, with the, 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 the corpus in which you're, um, um, the, the, that's, that's being used. So one takeaway here is um, However, even if the algorithm is, um, is, is precise, the corpus may reveal unwitting, um, unwitting bias um, from, from, the, from the, the, the questions you ask of it. So just to summarize, um, if, um, uh, if, if AI is going to be used by, by, by publishers in a more, um, uh, in a more effective way, um, there's, uh, I've got four recommendations. Um, one is to, um, rather than simply saying, um, you know, AI is a nice thing, let's try it, um, start with a use case. Actually, uh, start by asking it to do something, um, something sensible, like um, uh, finding, uh, uh, finding an expert to, who can peer review a paper or finding the most relevant journal for a manuscript. Um, after that, choose the most appropriate tool because Going back to the earlier example, it may be that a taxonomy is, um, is, is best for it. It may be that this automatic concept extraction is most appropriate, but you decide. It may be you need technical skill uh, in-house to manage the, the AI, or hopefully you don't, and it simply works and, um, and you can, you can um, make effective use of it. 
you certainly want to make sure that, is, that humans can contribute to the, to the outcome. Um, and then identifying the appropriate metric, Ollie mentioned sort of um, how, to, how, to, how to measure that. That's another PowerPoint glitch. Um, the, um, uh, and the metric may be um, uh, the time or the cost, and, um, and an A-B test may be, very, um, may, be, may be very effective, but it certainly requires some kind of evaluation um, in order to, to, to decide how, how useful it is. And then finally, uh, advise and, um, and be aware of bias. Um, where, because bias may be revealed by, the, by, by simply the, the use of these, uh, the deployment of these tools on a corpus which, um, uh, where the, the bias wasn't, um, wasn't, wasn't clear before. That's it, thank you very much. Right, thank you both. Um, okay, so while you're thinking of some questions, I'm going to ask Roger in the AV booth if he's going to take a chance and lower the blind so they're not getting blinding sunshine in their eyes. This is always a very high-risk moment in this room because sometimes the blinds work and sometimes they don't, but we'll see how we go. Um, right, meanwhile, so if you're thinking of some questions, um, please wave your hand, I will point to you, and then you'll receive a microphone. Please identify yourself or stand up if you feel moved so to do. So who's first with the question? Uh, yes, Richard there. Hello, Richard from Ghana. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just want to find out uh, um, semantic uh, scholar. How useful is it? I know as you, you took us through, it's more like a, a discovery platform. Can I use a semantic scholar to do any serious research assessment or research evaluation uh, in, in an academic environment? Thank you. I guess my answer to that would be uh, it's another tool you can use. So um, it's got a whole load of content in there from a whole load of publishers. It hasn't got everyone's content in there, but it's another portal that you can use. And I think it's interesting that it's got its own way of, of analyzing data that it's done. And so it may throw up things that you're not going to find somewhere else. How credible is, is that platform? How, how, how I think good? very. <laughs> Sorry? I, I would say very. I mean, they, they are backed by a, a lot of money, and they have a lot of people working all the time. So they're, they're going to be around for a long time. Yeah. OK, thank you. It's the Paul Allen Institute, by the way. So it's, it's, it's very heavily funded. OK. Someone else? New question? Don't make me ask a question. Uh, OK. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, there's a lady there. We're going to get two microphones. No, just one. There we go. Thank you. Hello. Jennifer Smith from University of London, St. George's. Um, so I was asking the question in the afternoon session yesterday about AI. So really interesting, many of those tools to me. Um, I just wondered a very specific question about the current peer review response, acceptance response level that you mentioned in the UNSILO presentation. So you said under the current peer review methods, there's usually um, about 25% of the peer reviewers approached declined. Do you have any sort of percentage on those that are approached using these methods, the AI methods, how many decline and how many accept? It's a, it's a good question. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, to come up with, uh, with, uh, with uh, precise uh, 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 statistics for, for, for peer review because the reason why people reject, of course, will be for, for several, several reasons. Um, but we did measure, um, we measured the, 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 the number of reviewers who accepted uh, which, um, which was broadly similar in an A-B test to the, to, the, uh, to the human method we were using before. But what we did find was that the time to find the, 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 a similar level of, of, of take-up was about half. So it's much quicker to find uh, a similar number of reviewers. So, so you've got the sort of time and quality. Um, uh, and in this case, the time was shorter and quality was similar. Okay, thank you. I slightly wonder whether the reviewers were telling the truth when they said, I'm not reviewing this because it's not my subject as well, or whether that was a convenient excuse. Uh, so, Tasha, you have a question. 
We actually tested on silo at the Microbiology Society, and I'm just pulling up the results now, um, <laughs> uh, which I think were the results that Michael was just referring to. Um, so they've now disappeared off my screen, which is excellent. So we tested 118 manuscripts through Unsilo versus 88 through manual reviewer suggestions uh, generated by my team. Uh, the editors adopted 12% of the Unsilo recommended reviewers and 13% of the manual recommended reviewers, so really a negligible difference. Um, but of the reviewers uh, generated through Unsilo, uh, only 2% of, of the um, total reviewers suggested agreed to review um, against 4% of the reviewer suggestions generated by my team. Um, but yes, it, it was vastly quicker to get reviewer recommendations out of Unsilo. One slight concern was that the average time taken through peer review doubled when using reviewers suggested by Unsilo. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> no, no, that's good. Yeah. All right, did you have a... Can we get you a microphone if you have a question, because then people will be able to hear you. I'm just wondering, normally when a human being is searching, there's sort of also kind of a bias towards people you know. So then they have a relationship with the journal, and usually if you have a relationship with the journal, you're more likely to review and more quickly. <laughs> 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 We do have three microphones. This somewhere. is just easier. Um, so my team deliberately were not picking people from our editorial or review boards. They were going through uh, PubMed to generate suggestions based on PubMed matching, um, but using a, a level of awareness of the subject matter and awareness of, uh, I, I believe, the institutions who generally have provided higher uh, higher engagement with us in the past. So not necessarily people who've written for us or reviewed for us, but people who would be aware of our journals through their colleagues. Thank you. It'd be also interesting to track bias, I suppose, and see whether AI is more biased in some circumstances and less biased in, in others. So that would mm -hmm. be an interesting area. Okay, um, more questions? Uh, gentleman right there. So is the issue there just that your training corpus lacks information such as this reviewer tends to respond quickly? That's the, uh, because the review, absolutely, because the, um, uh, all we're finding for the reviewers, the only criterion we're using is the papers they've authored. So we know nothing about um, uh, their willingness or otherwise to review. Um, uh, that information could be, uh, could, uh, could be attached and that would improve the quality, but that's not, uh, but the, but the, the particular tool we've, 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 we've got is simply looking at what they've authored. So we're looking at content matching. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, Mark, back there. Hi, Mark Alcott from Ebsco. I think one of you said that we've been sort of doing AI for 20 years, but then there was a slide suggesting that we're still sliding into the trough of despond. Um, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it working? Um, I'm just interested in, it seems to be lots of people throwing a lot of effort and time and resource at this, yeah. and they have been doing for quite some time, but we don't yet seem to be coming out the other side of that, if that graph is to be believed. It's a, it's a very good question, I think, Oliver. But my, uh, personally, I think um, uh, it's overinflated ex expectations. It's uh, very much that sort of garden uh, life cycle. Um, people think it can... Um, uh, I, 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 used to, uh, I used to expect, uh, for all the meetings I had with publishers, uh, 20 to 25 percent of uh, the time I'd spent would be um, trying to dispel myths about um, uh, what AI could, um, uh, could or couldn't do before we got onto something sensible. Yeah, and I guess what's interesting for me personally is, is I remember uh, I did, uh, my degree was in psychology and I did artificial intelligence as, as my specialism in uh, 1994. And even then it was like the new thing, this is going to be great and, and you know, here we, here we are. So one thing that's, that's made a massive difference and, th and this is in a way sad, but it's just computing power. You, mm. you can just... You've, the computing power is so, so, so much greater now. You can just do stuff that, takes, that would have taken forever a long time ago. It's not very clever, in a way. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Roger, we could risk another 20 centimetres on the blinds. <laughs> <laughs>
because that. <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs> okay, we're going to issue baseball caps so they're not blinded next time. Sorry about that. Right, um, more questions from the floor. While you're thinking of one, I'm going to ask about language. So a lot of this semantic um, AI work, you've talked about English language. Yes. Uh, what about non-English language? The, the, currently, we haven't, although the, the technology can work in other languages, as I mentioned, um, the, the machine learning part is language independent, but the, um, the syntactic layers that um, look at variations uh, are very much language based and so uh, we've only built an English language uh, a tool at the moment and, and to, because to develop a, another language would be a fundamental, would be quite a, a major, uh, a major initiative. Although uh, as Ollie will tell you some of the, um, some of the other companies in this space have, uh, have created their tools in, in more than one language. It can be done, it's just a significant investment to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to add a, a second or third language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those of us interested in, in internationalization of, of our products and software, that's a big one. That's, mm. um, you know, yeah, you might have got mm. it, yeah. I, I don't know what all the details are, but. <coughs> it's big. Okay, <laughs> all right, good. Um, next question, someone in the hall? Anthony, thank you. Just a quick message to Michael. Um, I have done the Google search while you were talking. <laughs> and it, it does, in fact, come out. I used slightly different wording, but it came out the same answer. Yeah. And uh, Margaret Court was the late leading lady. Okay. Uh, yeah, 24 okay. Uh, to 23, Serena Williams. But I was a little surprised. I'd forgotten <laughs> about, about her. But, but it did come to the same answer. It's really interesting. Uh, what have you tried? Yeah? Um, my question is, um, there was a period about a, two or three years ago um, when any sort of um, supplier in the production field was talking that they were AI, very much into <laughs> AI. Yes. It has, hasn't worked, has it? Or has it? Even if it's untrue? AI was bandied about um, uh, and uh, silly bandied about. As, uh, it's, it's very difficult to put AI on the, on the, on the mm. label, and I'm sure it improves your share price. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I, I think that's that's uh, that's both a sort of a um, that's it's it's nice for something to be a buzzword, but uh, but it's not very helpful. But um, uh, I, I think some some companies that are fundamentally um, um, working in a very manual way um, can sort of it's very difficult to sort of say we've got some AI in the mix because of course there are many AI tools. You can uh, be, you know string matching can be uh, become if you can you can call it machine learning if you um, if you. Um, um, if you if you run it a few times and then sort of feed back into um, uh, from from your results, so it's easy to add the AI label, but um, but I don't think um, it's not so easy to actually transform the company into a sort of fully AI enabled and uh, making effective use of what this technology mm. can do. Is That's it still being done? Is it still being used? As by is it st have they have a, the typesetters stopped who are using it inadvisedly? Um, I don't, I, I don't know. You're saying have they stopped using it? Have they stopped using it? Is this still a big selling point? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. That's but right. I think uh, I think it's not it's not surprising that uh, it tends to be startup companies that are using AI that are, that are effective uses of AI because it is a, a quite a fundamental change in the way that the 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 the, 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 the organisation mm -hmm. works to use it effectively. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's yeah. moving so quickly that that say someone like Highwire, we we couldn't do it. We, yeah. we need to rely on the partners to do it because it, it's just new things happen all the time. And so someone wants to, will come up with a new technique mm. and do something really clever with it. And we're like, oh, that's fantastic. Can we integrate with that in some way? But we, we haven't got sort of, a uh, semantic scholar have got 20 data scientists working the whole time just on this, mm. which mm. is fantastic. And then we, and the best thing we can do is just partner with them and, and then bring the results of that to you guys. Mm. But yeah, we, I think if we were trying to do that, which I think we probably were a while ago, it's, it's, it's not the right environment. For Can me. I say one quick thing, Mark? <laughs> Go but ahead. It's historical. Um, back in the early 1980s, there was a concern among um, the uh, US government that the Japanese were going to take over this area totally. And I went to the ICOT 3 meeting as I was computer science and mathematics editor at Oxford University Press in Japan and saw the piano playing robot <laughs> made by Yamaha. And the trouble was, you could only do one page at a time, so you had to hand it pages, <laughs> pages of music. 
Okay. We need robot page turners. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it hadn't got as far as that yet. That was too difficult. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we've got time for one more question. And uh, oh, in the middle there. Hi, um, Kave from River Valley Technologies. Just a quick um, uh, answer to Anthony's point. Y yes, um, we are in that industry, and and it's a little bit frustrating because everyone, the, the publisher, comes back and says, "These guys, these guys are using artificial intelligence. Why can't you?" And you, know, you can't use it for everything. Mm. Um, but just on on a small point, I'm wondering on in some specific cases whether we are uh, we can actually we can just use real intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence. So for example, uh, um, Mike, you, you, you talked about the heart and the cardiac. The machine knows which one it is. Now, in the case of an author writing a paper, the author knows exactly that you know, heart and cardiac and maybe other, some other terms are actually, they know what they're talking about. So maybe in that case, it's better that the author uh, says what that is, as opposed to we going and a machine trying to find out what that is. It, so, it, it, it sounds good, but one of, the, one of the fundamental challenges, one of the, 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 um, the, the, the fundamental problems with, um, uh, with the human brain is that um, uh, we can only communicate through the words that, um, uh, that, that authors have written. Uh, we can't uh, plug into their brains and work out their intentions. So uh, for better or worse, we have to work with those words. And that's uh, that's where and uh, and, and and natural language has um, has uh, ambiguity, and uh, and so so it's it, it would be nice to think um, if you uh, the reason why I don't think that's not such a good idea is anyone who's ever worked with author-generated keywords, you 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 you, you tear your hair out. There was a wonderful anecdote of a um, uh, the Australian National Library uh, created something called Trove, which is a sort of um, a collection of um, largely user-generated, including pictures. And people would paste pictures, um, and there was one picture of uh, a box of a window box of geraniums, and it was tagged New South Wales because the person who posted it lived in New South Wales. It's, uh, it's right. Just last comment from Tasha, and then we'll move on. It's a response to to Kaveh's question. One of the big drivers for a lot of publishers at the moment is reducing expectations and burdens on authors, and if we're going to expect them to start adding very, very rich and like. Synonym variants of, of their keywords. I think we're on a hiding to nothing. <laughs> yeah, good point. All right, on that note, uh, can I ask you to join me in thanking our two excellent speakers from this uh, session? Okay, a couple of, uh, couple of small announcements to make. So um, a couple of people have asked me, so um, slides from the presentations will be on the website within a, a week or two. Um, and also, obviously, the videos will then be up on YouTube as usual. Um, someone left a really nice pen in a box in one of the breakout rooms. So if you've lost a really nice pen in a box, um, please go and get it because it's yours. And if you don't go and get it, it's mine. Um, and uh, finally, so uh, we're now going to go to break. Uh, the uh, break is sponsored by Aries. Uh, so thank you to Aries. Please read there. Uh, information in the program. Uh, very glad to have them another new sponsor for the conference. So thank you to Aries, and we'll see you back here at half past three properly. Thank you.